Welcome to the Fit and Free with AIM podcast. I'm your host, Amy Louise. By listening to this podcast, you'll gain clarity and apply now principles in relation to training, nutrition, and mindset, all designed to help you build a strong and lean physique and show up as your best self. If you're a woman who struggles with excessive behaviors when it comes to training and food and think of yourself as a perfectionist, I hear you, I see you, I was you. And I know that you're in exactly the right place to change that narrative and build a body you love inside and out. Let's go. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fit and Free with AIM podcast. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. If anything jumps out at you or you'd love to discuss any points in this episode, feel free to head to the show notes where you can find the link to where I am on Instagram. And also, if you are tuning in, I would really appreciate it if you could share it on your Instagram stories and tag me so I can see The next thing I wanted to jump in and say was we are currently or I am currently accepting applications into my Glam Body photo shoot. We start prep for that on the 21st of August and the shoot date is on November the 18th. You do not need to be in a deficit to join us. The photo shoot is all about celebrating your hard work and consistency in the gym. The shoot will be a gym-based shoot this time, so it's the first time we're doing a gym-based shoot which means I believe it's going to be a bit more beginner friendly. So if you wanted to do a photo shoot, but the idea of a studio shoot is like too nerve wracking for you, then I think that this will be the one. If you want any more information on how you can get involved in the Glam Body photo shoot, then just shoot me through a DM and I'll get you all of the details. So this episode today, we're looking at 10 mistakes I made in relation to fat loss and how I fix them. These mistakes are primarily that I made them before I became qualified as a personal trainer. So they're spanning back quite a long time now. I think some of them you'll be able to relate to. Some of them may be mistakes that you weren't even thinking of and could actually be the obstacles that are getting in your way right now if fat loss is something that has been eluding you up until this point. So do make sure you stay around for all 10. All right, we're going to dive in. So the very first one is not having an understanding of the concept of energy balance, but believing that specific foods were going to give me the results I wanted and specific foods were going to cause me to gain weight. So of course, that's not true. You know, at around this time, I'm thinking sort of like 2005, 6, 7, 8, even further than that, actually, to be honest with you. Uh, I actually, yeah, all the way up to probably 2012, I didn't even know that these words existed. I didn't know maintenance existed, surplus, deficit. I didn't. I hadn't heard these terms before. hadn't heard the term energy balance before. I thought in order to lose fat, I needed to eat, you know, quote unquote, clean, unprocessed foods. And if I had like anything processed, chips, a chocolate, cake, the day was ruined. I just did not understand that. We all need a certain amount of calories to function, of course, and of course, and you know, maintenance and intake is a range. It's not a specific number, and that you know, overeating on maintenance would will cause you to gain weight if it's if it's sustained for long periods of time, and of course, eating underneath your maintenance intake to whatever degree will lead to fat loss over time, and it wasn't food specific. So the first mistake I made was really not understanding a concept of like deficit calories, maintenance calories, surplus calories, and thinking it was purely related to specific foods that I was eating. And just to, uh, I guess, fill this, fill this one out a little, a little bit further. So I would potentially be consuming like a surplus amount of calories of like clean foods But just because I had no idea of the concept of energy balance, I didn't realize that was a thing. I didn't realize you could eat clean foods and be in a surplus. So this is something I hear a little bit from new clients. They'll say, I'm eating healthy and they can't understand why they're not losing weight. So for whatever reason, they may have heard of these terms before, energy balance, maintenance, calorie surplus and deficit, but they haven't quite put two and two together that you can be eating in a surplus and be eating all really healthy foods. Those things are not mutually exclusive. All right, number two was that I really had in my head, and this was probably from women's magazines, 
that I had to eat 1200 calories a day or that a day or less, but forever. I didn't understand that. Again, it's really coming back to that concept of energy balance, but I didn't understand that like losing fat meant that I just had to be in a deficit and the particular calorie amount would be very specific to me and my activity levels. But with that as well, I also completely disregarded like the potential long-term side effects of such a restrictive approach. So I didn't understand that there were other ways to go about this. I didn't understand that 1200 calories was literally just a method being sold to women Um, you know, sell them the problem of body fat and then you get to sell them the solution. And 1,200 calories really is so restrictive. Almost everyone is going to yo-yo, which is fantastic for the company selling magazines and diet pills and recipes and all this other bullshit. Because great, if you get women in a cycle of yo-yo dieting, you can continue to sell it to them over and over and over again because you're not offering them a sustainable solution. It's a real head fuck, isn't it? It's horrible. Uh, but yeah, I didn't realize that no, almost no one needs to go that low. <laughs> like it's just, you just don't need to do that. Um, and yeah, there are other ways of doing things. <laughs> the third one is, this is very unfortunate. I'm just going to say it. But striving to emulate the appearance of individuals who unfortunately were suffering through eating disorders or disordered eating without fully grasping that negative impact that it was going to have on my health and well-being. So I saw these women and I didn't see disordered eating or eating disorders. Like I, that, I didn't see their, I didn't see them as having a problem that they were dealing with. I saw them as like the epitome of, I guess, like, you know, having their shit together. This is really, really unfortunate, but I'm, I am just thinking of times where I would be looking at like the Nicole Richie era of when she lost weight, when she was on like the simple life with, was it the simple life with Paris? And then she lost some weight. Like she was, it's so crazy to me. She was referred to as like the fat one. Um, But, you know, this is what I grew up with, and I'm sure some of you listening would remember this time as well. They call it like, what is it? Cocaine chic? Heroin chic, sorry. And yeah, it was just not realizing that all of these models and celebrities that I was looking up to were, you know, yeah, basically living off cocaine and strawberries, (laughs) you know, like, and I didn't appreciate the flow and effects of, or, you know, that they were there through mental health issues for, for starters, and really horribly, horribly oppressive pressures on them. Um, but I just saw that as like the epitome of, I guess, success, success and attractiveness. And now my values are very different and I see other things as <laughs> metrics of success and value. Um, and yeah, I, I just didn't appreciate the negative impacts of this outcome that I was seeking and what those women unfortunately were going through. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I just wanted to take a quick break to let you know how you can work with me. I currently have places available inside the Glam Body Program. And if you don't know what it is, this is my completely personalized programming, nutrition, and education online coaching service that is specifically designed to help women get strong and progress their body composition, whether that means gaining muscle, getting lean, or both. So Glam Body is best suited for two types of women. The first loves training, but you've never had a your programming or nutrition tailored to you. Perhaps you're just doing classes or using apps, but you do want more efficient results and you want to learn more about your body. Or perhaps you have had some element of assistance before, but you're still struggling with overtraining, under eating, speaking negatively to yourself, and you feel like nothing's enough. And you just want to be able to make physique and performance progress without burning the candle at both ends. So to get your spot, just DM me on Instagram with the heading glam body or you can fill out the application form that is linked in the show notes below and we can have a chat about whether Glam Body is a good fit for you. With that said, let's get back into the episode. And I think a lot of that is to do with maturity as well because you're probably hearing this and like I'm 36 now. So when I was thinking about these things, like the simple life was when I was in high school. Yeah, so very different concept of self and experience with life. 
The fourth one was failing to appreciate that there are degrees of being in a deficit and it's not a specific number or set of macros. Okay. So if we're thinking about, if I'm thinking of setting someone up for deficit calories, you know, I am considering where they're at in terms of their skill level, uh, their, you know, personal preferences and, how we think we're going to get the best results for this person in terms of like, do we do say a more moderate approach or a conservative approach of like, say, you know, 10 to 15%. Do we do something like a 20, 25, or then do we go slightly more aggressive at like 25, 30% deficit to start out with? And none of those things are wrong. Like all of those will work. The more aggressive we go off the bat, it's obviously going to require someone who is able to sacrifice a lot and I also have to be confident they're not going to yo-yo out of it, like that they have the skills to be able to cope with, you know, a high level of sacrifice and that once the deficit is finished, they're not going to pendulum swing because that's really, really dangerous. Uh, yeah, it's it's really easy to do if you don't have, if you're not equipped with the skills to be able to get out of an aggressive deficit like that, the person will just be like, they, they're unable to, to cope with all of that freedom and they lose all of the habits that they are engaging in, uh, which is fair enough. It's, it's hard to do and it should only ever be reserved for people who are very competent, but also like not emotionally attached to food types or eating or using food as an emotional regulatory tool. There are all those sorts of things that need to be ticked off for that person. Um, and also to be fair, this might sound counterintuitive, but the person who isn't attached to the fat loss result on an emotional level, because if you are, I think it really sets you up to be in a poor place coming out of the deficit. But also, yeah, we might do a more conservative approach. So a 15 to, you know, 15% deficit or so will take a little bit longer. The person then has to be equipped to understand that they may not see results for six to eight to 12 weeks and they have to be able to understand that. So that that comes with challenges as well because they have to be able to trust the process for long enough to get the result, right? Yeah, it's a really, really interesting one. But you can see there, it's not one number that's going to get you the result. You're going to get a fat loss result whether you're in a 15% deficit or a 30% deficit. The speed at which you'll see the result is different, but also the skills you have to apply for each of those um, approaches is different. But again, there are varying degrees. So just say you decide to get into a 25% deficit and you overeat, you might still be in a 10% deficit. So you're still in a deficit even though you overeat on your deficit calories, right? Because it's a range, it's not a specific number. Okay, number five is not having a timeline with a deadline and with that deadline also failing to then establish like a plan for that post fat loss phase. So if we don't have a deadline, the fat loss phase can seem exhausting because you think, oh, this is going to be the rest of my life. Like I'm going to have to make all of these sacrifices forever. And absolutely maintaining fat loss is going to require a different lifestyle than you're probably used to. It is going to require that you continue moving, whether that's steps, whether that's including a cardio or a couple cardio sessions, Um, In terms of maintenance of muscle mass, you're going to have to keep lifting to some degree. And the way life is set up now with the ease of access to convenience foods, you are absolutely going to continue to have to execute self-control around food. There's this huge notion at the moment that we all should be able to intuitively eat and maintain a lower body fat percentage. It is just... On, quite frankly, it's bullshit. We have access to highly palatable foods, these like ultra processed foods that are so tasty within probably less than a kilometer. Okay. And if you're listening to this, I imagine that you're feeling or are fairly privileged. So you have the financial resources to be able to buy this food and you might even be able to have the financial resources to get it delivered to your door right? It is so easy for us to overeat. And these foods are, they're made to be enticing. They're made to be so pleasurable. So I think it's really important that we just appreciate for a second that you are going to have to think about 
your intake. And that's not a fucking bad thing to be thinking about your intake and to basically self-parent. So I'm not a parent, but I'm sure as a parent, you are hopefully thinking about the health of your children and your your child may just not be thinking about their own health. And they're like, you know, I want to eat Doritos for breakfast every single day. And you're like, you know what? Maybe they can have them as a snack once a week or something like that. But otherwise, you're wanting to set them up with a, a, a nutritious breakfast, right? And we have to think about our uh, vitamin and mineral consumption. It's not just macros. Uh, we have to think about these things. We have to purposefully and intentfully think about our food intake. And that is not restrictive. It's thinking about all of the things we actually need to consume every day to support our health and well-being and it really grinds my gears when you know the thought of not eating 12 donuts for breakfast every day is labeled as toxic like come on like let's just just be adults here and we need to think about our well-being you know i've come from a restricted eating background and i completely understand when we start restricting our our food intake, it can set up all sorts of problems. But the difference here is starting your day thinking about all of these foods that I actually need to consume for health rather than starting the day focused on, oh, I can't eat 12 donuts. They're very different ways of starting the day and thinking about your food intake. And when we're properly nourished and satiated, yes, we're still going to want these highly palatable foods, but you'll be feeling incredibly satiated. You know you're an adult who can eat whatever, whenever you like, and you'll actually find yourself gravitating towards those foods in smaller portion sizes because you're full and nourished. Okay, all right, I went on a bit of a rant then. Um, but yes, having a deadline is very important. So if you don't have a deadline and just say you have 10, 20 kilos to lose, it might feel like it's going to take forever. But if you go, you know what, I'm going to give this my best efforts for a period of 12 weeks and then I'm going to give myself a month or two months off and then I'll go again, have some breaks and potentially go again and that might be all you need. It really does help you understand that this is not a forever process and in doing so you can focus on creating a lifestyle that includes activity daily activity no matter what phase you're in and it includes being intentful with your food intake no matter what phase you're in it's really really important to think like that and I think it also stops you from going, oh, I'll start again Monday. Oh, I had a Fredo, I'll start again Monday. No, no, no. No, we're going to get this done now. We're going to give it our best shot. We're going to give ourselves little breaks in between. And by doing that, we're not feeling so overwhelmed that this is a never ending process. And if you're always feeling like you're in a deficit, it means you're not actually being able to sustain whatever plan you have for long enough to get a result it's not working you need a different approach because most of our life should not be spent in a deficit most of our life should be spent roughly eating around our maintenance intake so our weight isn't yo-yoing around that's what we want to do okay and as well as that is having goals that assist your physical physical health or performance goals or whatever post the fat loss phase that allow you to continually to engage in healthful behaviors. So just say we're initially motivated by fat loss and we're doing all of these things that are very supportive of our overall health, but we achieve that fat loss goal. If we then stop doing everything we've done, well, we, the, our health benefits are going to go backwards, but of course, we're also going to lose that fat loss result. So once you've achieved your fat loss goals, I would definitely say move to potentially performance-based goals. And they can be like very light performance-based goals, but that will keep you in the process of staying active. So say maybe you do, um, you have a plan set up for fat loss. And once you finish that, maybe you reduce your training days to say two or three days a week, but you want to then pursue maybe yoga or you want to pursue netball or you want to learn a new skill right or a new sport something like that so that is what I would do you don't have to then continue doing all of the things that you did for specific to getting and you know optimizing your fat loss results but you can use that time to continue to engage in healthful active movement right that maybe looks a bit different 
Number six is fixating solely on scale weight, okay? So rather than focusing on your desired lifestyle and quality of life and your habits, because it's your daily routines that are going to shape your life and your lifestyle, it's not your weight. You can weigh your goal amount and have a terrible life that you fucking hate because it's not aligned with your values. Those two things can coexist. You can be at a scale weight and absolutely love your life, but it's not the scale weight that's going to help you love your life. It's you being able to live in accordance with what's important to you. And most often for most people that are feeling really happy, it's because they're healthy to the extent that they're able to be healthy as well. Okay, I know there's like, what's the definition of health? And then we have all of these, you know, the I guess, genetic health issues that might be bestowed upon us that we have to deal with. But to the extent that you're capable being able to support the quality of life through your own actions and behaviors is really going to be what shapes your overall sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. It's not a number because you can look exactly how you want to look or weigh exactly how you want to weigh and still hate everything about your life if it's not in alignment with what's important to you. Okay, and you can have both and you can weigh what you want, look how you want and be super happy. Like that's also possible, but it's very much related to how are you managing and functioning on a day to day basis? Like what is your life actually made up of? That will be the difference. Number seven is relying on foods as a means of emotional regulation. So something I did a long time ago. Believe it or not, it was my very first comp prep that taught me that there are other things that I can lean into to help me regulate my emotions, not food. So this could be things like journaling. It could be things like seeking out psychological support, counseling, therapy, speaking with friends, who you're surrounding yourself with, speaking up for yourself, setting boundaries, lots of internal work. There are lots of different ways that we can help ourselves emotionally regulate and even like education on how to do that different mechanisms. Um, Just reading a really good book at the moment called Emotional Agility by Susan David. I would recommend you check that out. Um, There's another book that I loved called Oh my goodness. Over I think it's overcoming the emotional storm. Maybe I'll try and put the link in the show notes. That was also really good and a very, very short book. But I've done years and years of therapy as well, both with like a mindset coach, which honestly was questionable now I look back on it. But it did help me reflect on myself, which I think was the important thing. But I've also had sessions with um, two psychologists for two separate areas of my life, and they were extremely, extremely helpful, as well as a lot of reading, of course. But that means that I don't need to rely on food for emotional support. Um, I'm doing other things to support myself, which end up making me feel much better. Eight, number eight is lacking, lacking consistency and diligence in maintaining your food intake and activity intake after the fat loss phase has finished. Okay. So what I do see a lot of people do is like, they'll be super, super diligent. And then once the fat loss phase is done, everything goes out the window. It's kind of what I spoke about before, or we just stop being as diligent and we won't be able to maintain our results if we stop being as diligent. So yes, we should be able to eat a little bit more uh, once we bring our calories up to maintenance, but we're still going to have to do all of the things we were doing to maintain the fat loss result or else we will, we will go backwards, okay? So just remember that when we're thinking about sustainability, it's not so much sustainability of these specific like deficit calories and this specific output, but it is still going to require you being intentful with your food and intentful with your activity. I think people fail to appreciate that maintaining a leaner or lean physique takes specific intention, especially in the way our life is set up right now, where most people very easily can sit down all day and most people have very easy access to highly palatable Uh, calorically dense convenience foods. So just for the, the, the context that most of us are living in now, we do have to be very intentful. Again, this is not being restrictive or toxic or any of those things. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Actually, we're looking at how can we 
support our health and well-being. And that does require intent because 95% of the population is not doing that. And it's very it's easier to not do it. It's easier to sit down all day and not move and go to 7-Eleven to pick up lunch. Like that is the easier option. It takes a lot less effort to think about moving, to to actually move, to think about and plan your food and your uh, nutrient intake. It takes a lot less energy to choose the convenient and easy option. Just want to call that out there, okay? Number nine was filling my macros with whatever and failing to think about the foods that help me feel my best. And this is, I'll be really honest, this is something I have been doing up until about this year. So it was getting better when I first started like tracking my food intake. I was very much like if it fits your macros um, and, you know, eating maybe a couple of meals a day that were really calorically dense and foods that weren't supporting me. Um, this is that was years ago, but even in just you know just recently in like the last couple of years, it was still being semi okay with food intake, but um, being undernourished in terms of vitamin and mineral intake. But this year, I've really been able to lean into like that self parenting. Like, imagine you're your own parent. You're of course going to well, hopefully, allow your child to have some fun things that have no nutrient value whatsoever because it's fucking fun. It's they're, they're tasty, they're nice, it's pleasurable. But then most of your intake for the day is going to be the foods that you know help you feel best. And it has a huge impact. I've been really thinking about this in terms of my training performance, but how do I sleep? Like the, the in, impact on food on my sleep, the impact of food on my mood. And there have been some foods this year that I would have probably gone to as like a, you know, fun foods, but I've actually gone, you know what, I'm going to eat this other food that still tastes really good. Maybe not as good as the fun food, but only because I know in three hours, if I eat, for example, like pancakes with jam, sugar, and lemon, which are amazing, that I actually feel like shit, man. Like I feel like shit after eating that food for, yeah, a good three to four hours. It's very, very tasty, but it's just not something I'm going to have maybe more than once a year or something like that, right? Um, I will save it for the, you know, special occasion, like maybe birthday or whatever. I don't feel restricted because um, I can have something that gives me a similar amount of pleasure that doesn't make me feel as shit. So for example, I've been bloody frothing English muffins with like butter and jam. And that gives me like a similar feeling, but I don't feel anywhere near as lethargic and shitty as I would after having like full pancake parlor pancake stack, right? And that that is just a really easy example of like just making that self-parenting decision. Um, I can engage in something that's tasty and that I like that's not going to feel shit. Number 10 is leaving too much to chance. So I've done this multiple times made this mistake multiple times and it just I never get as good results and I never get as efficient results so plan everything that you can possibly plan like with (laughs) honestly I the clients who Tetris their days are not getting the better results they're just not okay so when when are you going to do your steps when are you going to do your cardio when are you going to do your training sessions what time do you go to sleep what time do you wake up Um, What is your food going to look like for the day or the week? And what tools do you have to deal with significant stress that aren't related to food? Okay, have a think about all of those things. Have a plan, but also there is research to suggest that people who anticipate obstacles and plan ahead of time for how they might be able to deal with obstacles are also going to get better results. Okay, so for example, I've helped a couple of clients get some foods that they can freeze. So some pre-prepped meals that they can freeze just for those can't be fucked moments, um, which they know happen to them multiple times a week because of um, work that they can't predict. So if you know, if you're looking over the last month and go, you know what, I had 10 nights where I worked two hours longer than I thought I was going to. And that meant when I come home, I can't be bothered eating. So I got takeout. Well, what if we have foods that we still like, but that are also going to be closer to our nutrition targets in the freezer that we can just, you know, microwave or something like that, right? So think about the last month. Think about all of the obstacles that you ran into last month and those choice points where you made a choice that actually went against your goals. And then have a think about, like literally brainstorm, you know, five different options that might work and pick one that you want to try for the month ahead 
So that means when you come up to the obstacle, you're like, oh, that's fine. I already know what I'm going to do. I knew I anticipated this challenge. I already know what I'm going to do. And I'm going to be able to do that thing. Trust me, that payoff that you're going to get when you wake up the next day and you're like, man, you know, I encountered some challenges yesterday and I overcame them because my plan worked is going to be amazing. And if your plan doesn't work, that's fine. We just go back to the drawing board and think again uh, about what can we implement? What can we try this month to help ourselves? Okay. So this is going to also free up your mental bandwidth because we only have a certain amount of willpower that starts diminishing as the day goes on. And if you're having to think long and hard about solutions in the moment, you're going to go with the easier option, which typically in the way we are set up right now is probably not going to align with your goals. So don't even let that happen. Think of solutions ahead of time so you don't have to rely on willpower. This is the time I train. This is the time I um, do my cardio. This is the foods I'm eating. And if for whatever reason I have an obstacle, this is my backup plan. Like none of it is left to chance. You've already thought about it. It's not going to take anywhere near as much brain power. um, And you're not going to have to rely on willpower because it's all set up and ready to go for you. So there we go. I hope that that was really, really helpful um, in listening to the 10 mistakes I made and how I fix them. I imagine that at least some of them are going to be applicable to you if you haven't yet seen those that success through fat loss phases or, and or maintaining your results long term. With that being said, as always, if anything jumped out at this episode, definitely feel free to shoot me through a message. And actually, I've also got a resource for you in the show notes, which is your your cut phase cheat sheet, which is going to make sure throughout all of the areas that you need to tick off for a successful fat loss phases, you can go through one by one and make sure you're in a really good place which, with each of those areas. All right, guys, that is it for me and I'll chat to you next week. Mm-hmm.